This is CBC Here and Now. Next weather maker on the way, it's going to be a messy and windy Wednesday. And I'll be there to support that new leader at the Liberal Party. If you still listen to me, I would say, do the honorable thing. Step aside. At least one call for Dwight Ball to step down immediately as the Liberal Party prepares for a leadership race or a coronation? After arrival, we were able to uh, secure the area. A man taken into custody after a security threat at Memorial University. 24 hours after the Premier resigned, he insists the scandals plaguing his government had nothing to do with his departure. In a sit-down interview with Here and Now, he insists it was entirely a personal decision that, despite pressure from inside his own cabinet and caucus, to go. Tonight, we have the latest on the Premier's resignation and what will happen next. Here now is... Right, obviously still big news the day after quite a show we had last night so what's your sense of what the premier was really trying to tell you this afternoon well anthony he really avoided taking any personal responsibility for the scandals that have plagued his government now during my interview in the premier's office this afternoon he insisted that his departure is all about timing there could be an election right after the spring budget. Sources have said from inside the party that there was pressure from cabinet and caucus for him to go over his handling of recent scandals. Now, he was also set to face a leadership review by the party in June. He insists, though, he's not leaving now in order to avoid the party's judgment. It was never anything that I was, uh, I was afraid or scared you know, to put myself out there. That, those endorsements, I've been through quite a few of them. So those reviews were anything that I've always backed away from. In your address last night, you said that an MHA needs the confidence of people in order to be able to govern. Do you feel you've lost the confidence of the people? No, I don't no. at all, because right now we've been through a number of challenges. We just won a minority government, you know, less than a year ago. So it was obvious there we won the popular vote in that election. So I had not lost the confidence of people in Newfoundland and Labrador. And I'm going to continue to contribute to this province just in a different way. Now, we'll hear more from my interview with Dwight Ball a little later on the show, but we also heard today from Chess Crosby. Even before we know who the candidates are to replace Dwight Ball, let alone who's actually going to win the race, the PC leader is trying to attach those past scandals to the future leader. The uh, next leader, or next premier of the Liberal Party, uh, will be burdened by all the accumulated baggage of corruption and incompetence that the current government of Premier Ball is burdened by. That is not going to be easy to shake. Okay, so this race, whoever that's going to be, how's that shaping up? Well, we just heard from the party president uh, late this afternoon, Anthony, and uh, so far, while they, even though they have been meeting all day today, they still don't have those rules figured out. We're expecting those a little later in the week. But okay. we're starting to get a sense of who some of those contenders might be. So far, no one from inside caucus is stepping up. We have hard nose from cabinet ministers like Andrew Parsons, Siobhan Cody, Jerry Byrne. The two maybes that we're hearing, and they're waiting to see what those rules look like, well... One of them is coming from Paul Antle, who lost in the last two provincial elections and lost the leadership race for the Liberals to Ball back in 2013, but he said he's considering it. He told me this afternoon, am I interested? Absolutely. I'm giving it very serious consideration. And then there's Andrew Fury, who has a lot of support from inside caucus and cabinet. He's only saying that this was a surprise to me. I am interested, but need to discuss with my family and colleagues. Now, interestingly, though, behind the scenes, Fury has been organizing, uh, does have some of that support from within the party. Uh, so if either of these two men, interestingly, do end up going into the premier's chair, it would be the first time we had a premier who had never faced and had never been elected into a position. Yeah, it feels so like different times, right? This all seems kind of novel. Plus, there's the price for getting into the race. Right. The last, determined. yeah, the last time it was twenty thousand dollars was the entry fee to join the Liberal leadership race. So, well, yeah. that, those are the sort of things that the party's working out right now. And they want to try to get this done within 
60 days? 60 days, which would be into April. Right. And we heard again today from the Premier that he wants the new leader to put a stamp on the budget. Even Chess Crosby agreed. The new leader has to have a say in what that budget is because they're the one who's going to have to try and get it passed. Mm -hmm. And then they're the one who's going to have to wear whatever's in it. Right. And the House resumes the week after next. Peter Cowan, thank you very much. 2020, the <laughs> news just keeps on coming. <laughs> there we go. Peter Cowan live with me here in our Here and Now studio. Well, MHAs across the province are reacting to the Premier resignation, but only one has referred to it as, quote, a bright shining light for the Liberal Party. And those words are from Eddie Joyce, a former Liberal. Ball ousted Joyce from the Liberal caucus in 2018. And today, the MHA said the Premier's decision to stay on for even just a few months is a mistake. We have a budget coming up. Uh, there's going to be a major deficit in the budget. And now you have a Premier who don't have the support of his cabinet or caucus who's going to say, well, I'm going to go ahead and oversee see this and say, I'm going to try to get a leadership in April, which is almost uh, impossible to have. If, if I was still friends with Dwight Ball and if he was still listening to me, I would say, do the honorable thing. Step aside. You had your day. You did lots. You did some things in the province, Newfoundland, Labrador. People would understand it's time to move on. More um, politics later, but staying with this story and the federal connection, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau issued a statement today about Dwight Ball's departure. Trudeau wrote, I thank Premier Ball for his service to Newfoundland and Labrador and to our country. He wrote, an active member of his community and former entrepreneur, he worked hard to foster sustainable economic growth for the people in his home province and across Atlantic Canada. So that's what the politicians have to say. Well, what about the people in Ball's own district? As here and now's Troy Turner reports, he's getting moral support for his, design, for his decision to resign. Town of Deer Lake, he's known as Dwight. And he returns those first name only greetings to most. I hope he continues to stay on for this district because I like the guy. Yeah, and I'm, I'm actually a conservative. So there. Most here were surprised by the timing of his resignation. They didn't suspect it last week as he talked how his government would deal with power rates. But the decision also made sense. You know, I was surprised, but I don't blame him. I mean, like I said, it's, it's, politics is a tough go, and he got left with a mess. And I think he's done a really good job. I mean, you know, it's about time he, uh, he can only do so much, and then you say, you know, I've washed my hands, I've had enough, that's it. More important than being Deer Lake's mayor, Dean Ball is a brother first. He's proud of his older brother's record. Comes a point of time in everybody's life that, um, you know, uh, especially with grandchildren and kids that are, uh, you know, you had to make a decision, you know, I mean, are you signing up for another four years or, or do you leave now? And, you know, I mean, I certainly uh, have the utmost respect for my, for my brother. I think he's done a fabulous job. Before Dwight became Liberal Party leader, he and Dean spoke of what it would mean to his personal life. It's a lot of juggling, and it's, you know, it, 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 has, a, it has a toll. It's not a five-day-a-week job. It's not a 40-hour week. It's, it's seven days a week, 365 days a year, and you don't have any private time. You don't have any personal time. You, don't, you, know, you can't even get a vacation. The resignation will bring the brothers closer, something Dean Ball is looking forward to. Every time you talk to him, he lights up when you, when you, when you start talking about grandkids. And, uh, you know, I've had several conversations with him lately that, uh, you know what, he's excited now and one chapter closes and another one opens. And, uh, you know, I respect his decisions and I'm look, certainly looking forward to getting uh, a brother back the way it used to be. While most of the people I talked to today didn't want to do an on-camera interview, there was a common thread in what they had to say, and that was that Dwight Ball is a nice man dealing with a very difficult situation. The people of this district will surely be watching who's going to be left to deal with that situation next. Troy Turner, CBC News, Deer Lake. <laughs> You can see from that uh, picture from uh, Troy, it's a beautiful afternoon for most of us. Temperatures dropped as well. Here's where we're sitting right now. Uh, temperature wise, minus 8 to minus 10 across the board, a little cooler up through Labrador. We're going to uh, say goodbye to those temperatures for a little bit as uh, our next weather maker starts to move in. It's pushing in some snow already to the maritime provinces. That's going to head our way and be really messy as we head through the day tomorrow. We've already got some wind warnings in place along uh, for most of eastern Newfoundland as well as some 
rainfall warnings and then a winter storm warning for the southwest. I'll have all those details. We'll time it out coming up. It's only about the size of a two liter carton of milk, but in a couple of years, this will be launched into space and will orbit the Earth. We'll tell you what it's for coming up. Well, a very stressful situation for students and staff at Memorial University this afternoon. Tonight, one man is in custody after a report of a man on the campus with a gun. A dozen police vehicles dispatched to Munn's engineering building as it was evacuated this afternoon. Police say it's too soon to determine if the man police are questioning is going to face any charges. They also did not confirm if the man actually had a gun. A uh, short time after arrival, we were able to uh, secure the area and uh, make contact with that man and uh, the matter was brought to a peaceful resolution. Uh, that man is in custody right now and that investigation is ongoing. Memorial University called it a stressful experience and is encouraging staff and students to use their available counseling services if needed. Another incident involving a gun occurred over the weekend in Western Labrador. Police say somebody shot at a Wabush home, killing a dog and also damaging a house. The RNC says the incident happened Sunday at around 2 p.m. on Commercial Street. Nobody inside the home was injured and police say the incident is not believed to have been a random act. Well, Coast Guard made an unexpected discovery in Kitty Vitty Harbor. During a flyover to assess the damage caused by last month's big blizzard, crews spotted a sunken boat. Now, if you take a look there in the center of your screen, you can actually see it. The vessel washed off of a slipway. The Canadian Coast Guard worked with the boat's owner who operates a tour boat business to recover that vessel. And that job took some heavy equipment. And remarkably, the Coast Guard say no pollution was leaked into the water. Well, a gathering at Government House in St. John's this week celebrated the life and work of a respected archivist. Larry Doey died of a brain hemorrhage back in August. On Monday, he was given this year's Newfoundland and Labrador Historical Society Heritage Award. Cesare has that story. As an accomplished archivist, writer and storyteller, Larry Doey made this province's history more interesting. Beyond that, he was kind, helpful, compassionate, and genuine. And as one put it, he was friends with hundreds and known to thousands. His husband, Ian Martin, accepted the Heritage Award from the Historical Society on Doey's behalf. When Terry Bishop Sterling nominated him last fall, we just, there was no question. Everybody on the board thought, yeah, we didn't even need to have a discussion about it. As a matter of fact, I got on Larry's boots. Uh, those are his boots he gave me, and as a matter of fact, uh, I still wear his watch that was given to me. So uh, not just those material things, but rather his heart is with me. And, uh, his brother Wayne says all 11 siblings are honored that Larry's volume of work and contribution to the province is getting the recognition. At the same time, to be honest, it's a great honor, a great tribute, but at the same time, it's, uh, we wish that it wasn't real. Brother-in-law, Senator Fabian Manning, says Doey was devoted to his family. He'd call his brothers and his sisters and he'd be checking in on the family. I mean, uh, you know, my, my son lives down in, uh, married down in Harbour Breton. And, uh, you know, they were, had a, the christening of their child. And, you know, seven hour drive and who drives into town only Larry and Ian. You know, and I mean, it just, he, he, was, he was all about family. Doey's husband may have summed it up best. Ian Martin said when it came to Doey's love of the province's history, it was more than history. It was, quote, our family story. Cease Hair, CBC News, St. John's. I think it was a positive thing that he resigned. Uh, I don't think that he was competent to do the job anyway in the first place. I think they proved that in their first term when they uh, basically raise taxes on top of taxes. I'm hoping that uh, with his resignation, they'll be, uh, you know, there'll be another election perhaps and uh, it'll, we'll get somebody who is competent to do the job.
Welcome back to Here and Now. In about two years from now, this province will be launching its own satellite into space. The St. John's company Seacor has teamed up with engineering students at Memorial University to design a small satellite that will observe ocean conditions from Earth's orbit. This afternoon, I met up with three of the project collaborators to find out more. So this right here, this is the structure of the Killick One CubeSat. This is the full size of it. It's less than a foot long, and it's about the size of a two-liter milk carton. So it's a pretty tiny structure, and this will house essentially every single component for our satellite that we will be launching in space in 2022. Uh, the same material made of just standard aluminum, and this is the box that houses every single component for our satellite. It's cell phone technology that's really made this possible. I mean, you think of all the things that get jammed into a cell phone, uh, GPS tracker, the radios, all the computers that go in there. And, and it's really that kind of technology that's made these types of satellites possible. Uh, this will be the first uh, uh, satellite, Earth observation satellite in this province, uh, which will completely designed and manufactured by the people here, local. This satellite has to be launched from the International Space Station. We've, we've got a slot on a rocket which is really cool. That, that was given to us by the Canadian Space Agency. Um, that rocket will go up to the International Space Station. The astronauts on the International Space Station will take our satellite, put it in a launcher, and it will be ejected out into space. This satellite's gonna be 400 kilometers in space. So 400 kilometers is quite a distance away from the ground to be able to measure things on Earth. Its primary purpose is to measure information on the ocean, things like ice, things like waves, things that will be important to the offshore industry here, fisheries, transportation. Sea ice is important because we need to be able to understand where it is so that if a, a tanker wants to transit through there, uh, they have no trouble. This is important for search and rescue purposes. And it's important if, if there's an incident on a rig, for instance, they need to be able to get people off the rig. It's important to know where the sea ice is. And of course, for fisheries, uh, you really need to know where the ice is. A lot of people didn't really believe when I said that I had the opportunity to work on a satellite. It's kind of like, wait, really? You have that opportunity here at Memorial? You look up and you see, and you see all the satellites passing by when you're looking. And, it's crazy to think that we're going to actually be able to build one here in the province and actually watch it orbit around. The project offers a fantastic opportunity to the students uh, with a ch uh, inclusive, equal, and uh, diverse chain environment. By the time that we finish this and we start communicating with the satellite, we'll probably have had about 100 to 120 students have worked on this. That's quite an impact to have 100 to 120 students have experience in space systems. A space systems are very marketable skills, I might add, because a lot of times the students just come fresh out of university and have to get the training. If they had the training already, that's huge. You kind of look at space industry as something, you know, you see it in the States, you see it in big city centers. You don't ever think it's going to be something that happens in Newfoundland and Labrador and that you even have the opportunity to look at that field. It was just mind blowing and really fortunate to have the opportunity to even just work on the project and get exposure in the field. And Benjamin says he does hope to pursue a career in space engineering when he graduates from Memorial University, and it certainly seems like he's off to a good start. The Killick One project is expected to cost about half a million dollars and is jointly funded by the Canadian Space Agency and the provincial government. This weather update is brought to you by the NL511 app. No, before you go. Check road conditions, highway cameras, and the provincial plow tracker with the NL511 app. So I guess once that satellite's actually bouncing around up there, we'll have to put you on the follow story to yes. actually see the real images that it gets, right? Yeah, it's really cool that we'll have, uh, I mean, it depends on how high def it is. Hopefully right. it's uh, really high def. And then when he said the waves, that was kind of cool. Because mm -hmm. obviously any more tools in my toolbox for forecasting is really right. great. So, so what's $200,000? Four. To get one of those for you? Oh, yeah. yeah. All right. We'll call management. <laughs> we'll call I'll it. have it on Tuesday. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Well, I wanted to show you uh, a picture. So okay. we do have satellites from space that do, uh, you know, we do see. It was a gorgeous day today, so we were allowed or we were able to see that. What a shot. Isn't that a great shot? So that's starting in the morning and then into the early afternoon. If you pay attention to the ice, you can actually see it moving, uh, especially up through the straits. You can see it's blocked for the Strait of Belle Isle. 
and then we do have that ice moving further south. So we do have satellites, but it'll be neat to, uh, to see one that will uh, be right from Newfoundland and Labrador, which is kind of nice. So uh, all those clear skies were thanks to a ridge of high pressure. Those temperatures dropped through the day. You can see how cool they are right now, sitting anywhere from minus 8 to minus 10, the minus teens up through Labrador, which is actually warmer than it has been, certainly for Lab West. And we're going to hang on to these temperatures uh, for the night tonight. They're actually going to drop a little bit more. Going to stay pretty much where you're sitting right now for Lab West and through Central. Otherwise, dipping into those minus double digits, those winds will shift from northwesterlies to southwesterlies for the eastern portion of the island. And then by morning, we'll start to see those winds pick up uh, along the west coast, 30 to 50 kilometers per hour. But uh, until then, we'll actually see pretty light winds. Now, speaking of winds, we do have a wind warning in place for the rec house area. By morning, you're looking at gusts of 120 kilometers per hour. And then the winds pick up tomorrow afternoon for the south coast as well as most of eastern Newfoundland. We're looking at winds anywhere from 100 to 110 kilometers per hour. And again, that's ahead of our next system. A uh, number of warnings as well. Blowing snow advisories along the west coast. Winter storm warnings towards Burgio. And then essentially from the Conagra Peninsula down through the southern half of the Avalon. You're looking at rainfall warnings and then a special weather statement in effect for the Avalon. So let's time this out. Snow moves in tonight by morning, early morning for the southwest. There's those winds I was talking about out of the southeast. And then as that uh, snow will pretty much uh, move across the island as we head into the, er uh, the morning hours, and then we'll start to see a change over along the south coast. So by 10, 11, noon uh, is when we'll start to see that change over to rain. The snow will be heavy at times, though, for the first half of uh, the morning. And then eventually that'll change over to rain pretty much from central eastward. You're going to see drizzle through central, but then uh, towards the Avalon, you're going to see a little bit heavier rainfall through the day. That's when those winds really ramp up. As that low moves off, we'll start to see that wrap around again with those colder temperatures and then snow will redevelop along the west coast and continue really pretty much into Thursday uh, afternoon. So here's what I'm thinking snowfall wise, a good five to 10 centimeters across the board. The most snow will be for the southwest, looking at about 15 to 25 centimeters. And with that, more than likely going to see um, that in the higher elevations, otherwise 10 to 15 centimeters is a good bet. And as far as that, uh, the winds go again into the afternoon. By noon, we're looking at those winds gusting anywhere from 100 to 110 kilometers per hour and then continuing uh, to fall, but still staying quite strong as we head through the day on Wednesday. So just quickly want to show uh, how much rainfall is expected. We're looking at uh, anywhere from 20 to as much as 30 uh, millimeters of rain for the southern half of the island, uh, southern half of the Buren rather, and the Avalon, otherwise about 10 to uh, about 5 to 10 millimeters of rain. So it's certainly going to be messy. I'll uh, have the forecast for tomorrow and we'll look ahead when I come back. Well, he, he, he took, he's taking the easy way, really easy way out. He don't want to deal with these uh, problems with the pipeline. He don't want to deal with mushroom falls. Everything across Canada is all shagged up. And not only Canada, across Canada, Newfoundland is the most shagged up with, air, with him. Now he wants to resign uh, because he, want, he wants to go home and see his family, spend time with his family. I don't understand that. And I voted for him, sir.
Well, let's get back to a story that a lot of people are talking about today, the impending resignation of Dwight Ball. Well, here's part of his one-on-one -on -one conversation a few hours ago with the CBC's Peter Cowan. Premier, less than a year ago, you won a general election, albeit with a minority. Why, less than a year later, decide to call it quits? For me, it was, uh, you know, I've taken time to reflect on my political career. It took some time over the holidays, realizing that a priority for me was rate mitigation. I wanted to make sure we had that plan in place. And then, uh, after 10 years in politics, you know, nearly in my fifth year as Premier, uh, made a decision that was time for renewal for me and uh, wasn't prepared to run in another election, made that quite clear. But when you have cabinet ministers and caucus members who are not happy with your leadership, there was a leadership review that was going to be coming up in June. How much did that pressure weigh into what you say is a personal decision? Leadership review is something that I've always embraced. I, I've I enjoyed organizing the party for leadership reviews because it means you're then ready for an election. So I've always embraced the leadership reviews. They're part of what you do. It's part of the process of being a leader of the Liberal Party. So you know that going in. It was never anything that I was uh, I was afraid or scared you know, to put myself out there. That, those endorsements, I've been through quite a few of them. So those reviews were anything that I've always backed away from. In your address last night, you said that an MHA needs the confidence of people in order to be able to govern. Do you feel you've lost the confidence of people? No, I don't at all, because right now we've been through a number of challenges. We just won a minority government you know, less than a year ago, so it was obvious there. We won the popular vote in that election, so I have not lost the confidence of people in Newfoundland and Labrador, and I'm going to continue to contribute to this province just in a different way. Why not step down now and put an interim leader in place, someone else who can start that renewal process right away? Well, keeping that stability in place right now is important to me. It's uh, from the bureaucracy that you, know, that you need to actually transition from one leader to the next for a matter of a few months. Adding that stability is there with the experience that we have in managing uh, you know, from the Premier's office is important. We'll reach out to our cabinet and our caucus, of course, that we always have because it's a teamwork approach. And I'll be there to work with the next leader and work with my cabinet colleagues and, and caucus colleagues right now, as well as you know, reaching out to uh, other parties and other opposition members you know, within the province as well, as well. This is all important as we now face you know, and move through this transition period. A couple of the names that are surfacing, Andrew Fury is one. Do you think he'd be up for the job? You know, that's up to Andrew, but I, you know, I've known Andrew a long time. He's been around the party for, for quite some time. And, you know, this is up for Andrew to make his, uh, to make his decision if he's interested in doing this. Uh, so, but I can tell you right now, this without question, I'll be there to support whoever that leader is. What about Paul Antle? Do you think he would do a good job as Premier? Same answer. It's you know people that are willing to contribute to the to Newfoundland and Labrador. They have a passion for the place and they wouldn't be they wouldn't be thinking about this if they weren't interested in the future of Newfoundland and Labrador. You've still got at least a month or two left. What's on your to-do list? Oh, it's it's the back to work and and doing the things that premiers do. You know, we'll have our regular caucus meetings, our regular cabinet meetings, and I'll be attending functions. And, and but is there anything things. specific that you're like, you know, no. this is the this is the last time that I'm going to have no. to influence an entire province. No. I want to make sure that no. No. I get this done. No, it's business as usual for me. I come in and I do the analysis. I I make decisions based on the information that I have in front of me. I use my cabinet, my my colleagues, my cabinet secretariat that have always been there. So it's it's business as usual. But we will be obviously using the same processes that we use in place. So I'm not looking at a list here and say, this is something that I must do before I leave this office. I will do it only when it benefits Newfoundlanders and Labradorians. Well, Premier, thanks for speaking with me today. Thank you, Peter. Well, more reaction now to Dwight Ball's decision to step down as Premier. Eddie Joyce is the independent MHA for Humber Bay of Islands. He was a lifelong Liberal until Ball ejected him from caucus in April of 2018. And Joyce won a landslide victory in last year's election, which saw the Liberals lose majority status by one seat. So, Mr. Joyce, what do you make of the fact that Premier Ball says he's stepping down, but he's actually going to stay on as Premier uh, and political boss for the next couple of months? Well, personally, I think it's uh, problematic. Uh, here you have a Premier who says that uh, I'm stepping aside, but I'm going to stay on as Premier. Uh, he's he's going to make up.
of those decisions. Who's, if there's an executive appointment, who's going to make that decision? Uh, the person, uh, the chief of staff, Greg Mercer, who he, he himself said uh, Mr. McIntosh went down and got the contract. Is he still going to have the same authority uh, in this government? It's very problematic. Uh, I've yet to see this happening anywhere across Canada where the premier stepped down and said, I'm going to stay on. What if the leadership goes past April? The last liberal leadership went over four months. So there's a possibility that he'll still be in that same position without the support of his cabinet and caucus for the next four and a half months. We're going into July or August. It's, it's unheard of, actually. Now, you, you mentioned uh, cabinet and caucus. Now, you know, and I think a lot of people know, that his cabinet ministers, some of them were basically saying, hey, you, you have to go. It's time to leave, Dwight. How does he govern when he's looking around a cabinet table where at least half a dozen of his ministers clearly sent him the message that they, they don't want him as leader anymore? Uh, actually, it's going to be very difficult uh, to govern. And who's going to suffer is the people of the province of Newfoundland and Labrador. Uh, we have a budget coming up. Uh, there's going to be a major deficit in the budget. And now you have a premier who don't have the support of his cabinet or caucus who's going to say, well, I'm going to go ahead and oversee see this and say, I'm going to try to get a leadership in April, which is almost uh, impossible to have. Uh, it, the people of Newfoundland and Labrador, and, and like if, if I was still friends with Dwight Baum, if he was still listening to me, I would say, do the honorable thing. Step aside. You had your day. You did, lots, you did some things in the province of Newfoundland and Labrador. People would understand it's time to move on. Now, Mr. Joyce, there was a time when you and Dwight Ball were, were good friends, liberals on the West Coast. You probably know him better than most MHAs. Dwight Ball kicked you out, and now he's being kicked out. Is this a kind of political karma? For me personally, it's sad. Uh, it's sad. Um, as I look back at the friendship with Dwight Ball and his leadership, and respect, and 58 days on the road helping this man to get elected. And because he felt, you know, and, and he told me personally that Sherry Gammon Walsh was getting uh, women's groups to fill the galleries. He had too much public pressure. He knew I was right. He knew he had the information. If it's right, Paul, to, to not stand up for someone uh, like myself who, who stood by him for personal, uh, when he was in personal trouble, when, when he was in political trouble, and for him not to do it, it's sad for me. It's actually sad because I had all kinds of visions of myself and Dwight Ball leaving the political scene together. So as good friends, we came in together. I helped him become premier of this province. Uh, so I don't take no joy in this, absolutely no joy in this whatsoever. Uh, I just feel kind of sad uh, that this is happening right now. And uh, I'm not a vindictive, I'm not a mean person. I wish him all the best, but I just wish that he had the courage to stand up, not for Eddie Joyce, but for what was right. So I'm sad, this is a sad day uh, for me and and personally, because I went through a lot with Dwight Ball. Mm -hmm. I stuck by Dwight Ball, Dale Curtin stuck by Dwight Ball. So uh, it's a sad day, but you know, Sometimes when, when you lose people who you trusted and people who gave you a lot of good advice, this is the kind of thing that happens sometimes. All right, uh, Eddie Joyce uh, on the West Coast, appreciate your time this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anthony. Hi, I'm Dan. Uh, we were just talking about the Premier. Um, I don't know too much about it, but um, just looking at it from the outside, it does seem like an extremely stressful situation for anyone. So, I mean, a part of me feels a little bit of empathy for someone like that, feeling like they need to step away for whatever reason.
Bill Gregory was a voice in Newfoundland radio for almost 25 years. Now he's come home to the family farm. Bill Gregory, off air, Sunday at noon and Monday at 7. Welcome back. A major corporate donation was made to cancer care last week. Fortis put forward half a million dollars. But it was a young cancer patient who drew the loudest applause. Megan Waterman shared her story of fear, compassion, and determination. Cease Hare was there. It's just another day for 21-year-old Megan Waterman. A MUN student and cancer patient, she's also this year's Shave for the Brave ambassador. And she's about to speak to more than 100 people and share a deeply personal story. A year and a half ago, before turning 20, Waterman was diagnosed with ovarian cancer. The journey started with shock, an emergency room visit, the discovery of a solid mass, emergency surgery, and a very unexpected diagnosis. A cancer diagnosis at any age is terrifying. Although I didn't feel overly scared at first, as a young adult, I felt cheated. I finally found my path and I started the program that I worked so hard to get accepted into. And now I didn't even know if I had a future to be excited about. The room, deadly silent as she continues her story of immediate chemotherapy treatments and news that her cancer was more aggressive than originally thought. I left that appointment that day and got dropped off to my boyfriend's house. I went in there thinking that we were going to break up. Because how is it fair to make him to continue to love somebody that only has a 30% chance of survival? How do you tell your loved ones that? It broke my heart even more to tell my friends and my family the news than I did hearing it for myself because at the end of the day, it's going to be them who's going to have to cope with me not being there anymore. Unfortunately, this is all a part of the disease and I had to be there for my loved ones just as much as they had to be there for me because cancer affects everybody. And amid all that fear, a simple act of kindness, a nugget of compassion that made all the difference. While I was processing everything that my doctor had just told me, a nurse that was in the room said to me, you are so sweet. <laughs> this might seem like a meaningless comment to some, but it means absolutely everything to me. I'm now able to look back and remember that someone made me smile when I found out that I had cancer. <laughs> and I now have a loving memory within an absolutely terrible one. Another speech over and it's back to Torbay. It's all part of her mission to push the importance of donations. Her parents couldn't agree more. It's greatly appreciated and uh, not just by us, by, by everybody, by the community. And uh, it's, it's, it's something that it's, sometimes it's, it's hard to put in words what it really means to, uh, to people individually. I'm so glad that uh, we were uh, invited to be a part of it. Um, it really gave us a boost. Um, all the enthusiasm and generosity and love in the room too. Um, it's really helped me, it's been a struggle and um, I'm, I'm so grateful to Fortis and everyone in the room. I just, I feel like we're gonna have a great weekend now after, after that activity, yeah. The chemotherapy is over, but immunotherapy treatments continue and Waterman hopes to be done by this time next year. And until then, she's working on her honors degree, taking it treatment by treatment. Cease here, CBC News, St. John's. Well, turning to national news now, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau called for dialogue today to end the protests that have shut down rail service right across the country. But there's no clear sign yet of actual dialogue or action to resolve the crisis. It's all sparked by the refusal of some hereditary chiefs in British Columbia to allow a gas pipeline to pass through their territory. Julie Van Dusen reports. It's now nearly two weeks that Mohawk protesters sympathetic to Indigenous opponents of a pipeline in northern B.C. have continued to shut down Canada's rail service. <laughs> Prime Minister Justin Trudeau was back in the House of Commons this morning calling for calm. I know that people's patience is running short. Trudeau says a show of force is not the way to go. And today, as Prime Minister, I am once again formally extending my hand in partnership and trust. Conservative leader Andrew Scheer called Trudeau's response weak. 
he demanded a plan to deal with what he calls the radical activists and end the blockades now. But nobody, and I mean nobody, has the right to hold our economy hostage, Mr. Speaker. Demonstrations have popped up in different parts of the country to support some Wet'suwet'en hereditary chiefs in British Columbia who oppose the coastal gas link pipeline. Rail shutdowns have severely impacted the economy. Trying to establish Carolyn Bennett, Minister for Indigenous Relations, was in BC yesterday seeking a meeting with hereditary chiefs but didn't get one. Perry Bellegarde, the head of the Assembly of First Nations, says the pipeline company, Coastal Gas Links, should get back to the table. The hereditary chiefs, you know, to my understanding, were, were put to the side, and, and that's not acceptable. This chief says protesters should stop for now. If you do not continue on a, di a dialogue of respect with the, the hereditary chiefs, then we'll be back. There are MPs who want to continue dialogue and there are MPs who want the police to act. The Prime Minister met today privately to consult with all opposition leaders except for Andrew Scheer, saying that Scheer's comments have disqualified him. Julie Van Dusen, CBC News, Ottawa. A government chartered plane is on its way to pick up Canadian passengers who are aboard that cruise ship that's quarantined in Japan. It's expected to fly them out on Thursday and bring them to Trenton, Ontario for further assessment. The health minister was asked today if those evacuees are going to face two additional weeks of quarantine. Every circumstance will be considering um, that particular person's health and the risk of uh, further infection. What we're trying to do as a country is do our global part in containing the spread in Canada. The passengers will have to be screened and cleared of any symptoms before boarding. The Diamond Princess has become the largest concentration of infections outside of mainland China. At least 43 of the 256 Canadians aboard have tested positive. For coronavirus, so far, more than 540 cases have been reported on that ship. And, uh, you know, whatever happened, or if the wrong choices were made, you know, uh, you know, the situation with Carla Ford, I'm not saying she didn't, uh, she wasn't able to do the job, but the way the job, the way things were done, I think uh, it wasn't the proper way of doing things. And, uh, you know, this is it. I think the time has come when uh, the white ball needs to move on.
The weather update is brought to you by Belltone, your partner in better hearing. All right, for anybody watching who's taken a ferry, it's probably everybody uh, who's <laughs> watching, stay tuned because we're talking about some weather. First about this big storm, Dennis, that's caused some major problems on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean. It is the second strongest bomb cyclone on record in the North Atlantic, and that's caused some severe flooding in Ireland as well as the United Kingdom. Yeah, but uh, I want to show you some video from Scotland taken just a few days ago. Look at that. So this is the ferry I was talking about. Just look at how much movement is in that, and the crew of that ferry getting high praise for what it managed to pull off in the stormy seas that you're looking there. The MV Caledonian uh, Isles was docking. This is at uh, Androssen Harbor. Uh, and this is during horrible winds, you can see. And just check this out. You know what? It actually managed to dock without any damage. Yeah. I mean, you watch that when it makes that turn there. Ooh. That is intense. Yeah. Yeah, I don't. That's, that's, that's people intense. watching. I can see people saying, you know what? I don't think I'm getting on today. No. Yeah, you mentioned Dennis as being a bomb cyclone. So what that pretty much is, is just means that the system rapidly intensified and lost 24 millibars of pressure okay. in 24 hours or more. In this case, it was way more than that. So, so just rapidly intensifying is what uh, bomb yeah. cyclones are. Bomb cyclone kind of says it all. It does, doesn't it? It sounds a little scary. <laughs> yeah, it does. But yeah, that's it. All right. No bomb <laughs> cyclones for us, but... No. But take a look how gorgeous this shot is uh, outside oh, our studio it's there. much nicer. It's a beautiful day today, mm -hmm. but uh, we are looking at uh, things getting increasingly worse as we head through the day tomorrow. Here's a look at uh, the temperatures. This is where we'll be sitting for most of the afternoon. Now snow to start and then transition to rain. A uh, number of areas seeing temperatures in the uh, single digits on the plus side of the mercury. You're looking at potential for some drizzle through central along uh, pretty much up through Corner Brook. The rest of you should stay as snow tomorrow afternoon. And then up through Labrador, you're looking at temperatures mild as well, especially for the southeast. Uh, you're looking at Happy Valley Goose Bay minus 5, mild for Lab City as well, minus 11, with uh, some flurries on the horizon for you. But again, those winds will be strong tomorrow afternoon. That low is going to head offshore, and then in behind that, we get back into that onshore flurry activity along the west coast with uh, a return of those colder temperatures. You'll notice we'll see that drop in temperatures through the day. Another uh, area of high pressure will just skirt south of us uh, into the evening. So Thursday, your temperatures will drop again. This is where we'll be sitting as a daytime high, minus 16 for Cornerbrook, and those cold temperatures are going to head east as we head into the evening hours. Another cold day expected for Lab City, minus 24, minus 20 for Happy Valley Goose Bay. And then again, similar temperatures along coastal areas of Labrador. So heading into Thursday night, uh, a little quiet into Friday. Again, that onshore flurry activity potentially with some sunshine in the mix as well. As we head into Saturday, that ridge will slide south, but probably will bring some sunshine to the island with another low tracking across Labrador. And you're going to see uh, some flurries with that one. Not a whole lot of wind, though. And then the next ridge of high pressure will move in. That's going to dominate. And it actually looks like a quiet couple of days for the weekend. By Monday, we'll start to see that next system roll in, and that's going to bring some snow with it. So here's where we'll be sitting temperature-wise. Six degrees tomorrow, and then dropping again. Overnight lows into the minus single digits, or rather minus double digits, uh, for both Thursday and Friday. Saturday and Sunday at this point look nice. Fingers crossed into the minus single digits. Might get a, might get might be a nice weekend to get out and enjoy that sunshine. Minus two by the time Sunday rolls around. For central Newfoundland, you're looking at pretty much the same thing, but overnight lows are going to dip a little cooler for both Thursday and Friday. And then by Sunday, should be sitting around minus one. Uh, for western Newfoundland, pretty much gray in those onshore flurries, but again, your temperatures will climb towards the end of the weekend. And then up through eastern Labrador, sunshine for Thursday, and then back into that unsettled weather pattern. But again, temperatures climbing into the minus single digits. That's well above seasonal for you for this time of year. And for western Labrador, Generally gray sunshine, uh, rather uh, some flurries possible both Saturday and Sunday with temperatures sitting around minus seven. Well, well I had to share this <laughs> cool photo with you. Take a look at that one. A little bit of a visitor this morning in that snowy weather. That's one of those goofy mirrors that gives you funny looking eyes, right? Uh, on the back, on the <laughs> shed, it definitely looks like it. I'll tell you where this is too when we come back.
All right, winding down here and now, but before we go, it's uh, Rick Mercer and Alan Doyle like you have never seen them before. Hi, my handsome boys. This is Rick Mercer's rants, because he acts tough and he hisses. There you go. So that's Rick Mercer and Alan Doyle, two of the cats rescued from Little Bay Islands earlier this winter, and those felines have been relocated to Halifax. Yeah, these two became instant best friends, so says the team at Sonia's Cat and Animal Rescue. Alan got his name, uh, Sonia says, because he's just as just a big, lovable dude. Yeah, kind of like he is. <laughs> but uh, unlike the real Rick and Alan, this pair are apparently very shy. Yeah, that's shy. Now, and if you're wondering what the real Rick and Alan made of all this, Rick took to Twitter, Mr. Mercer did, to say that he hopes he and Alan remain together, <laughs> while Alan promises to let Rick use the litter first. <laughs> All right. Well, there's an image. You'll have a hard time getting in my head. Uh, a better image. Yes. Isn't That's that a great a, shot? It's wonderful. It's, I love it. Looks like the moose is actually looking over looking, at the moose. Yeah. Under, not really understanding what was Indian going on. Bay. Indian Bay. Yeah. This photo was taken uh, actually on Moccasin Pond. Wow. This morning. Yes. They had a little bit of a visitor. Valerie Manuel sent me uh, that one on my Facebook page. So I had to share it with you. It does look like the moose is saying, okay. This yeah. is not one of my better days. Is I, this I, don't, real? I don't look like that. No. <laughs> it's a little bit of a mirror situation, yeah. <laughs> Great shot, Valerie. It is, yeah. Thank you so much for sending it in. If you have any to send, send them to NL Photos at cbc.ca. All right. Tomorrow, Wednesday already, midweek. A bit of snow yeah. for some of us. Snow, rain, messy, windy. See, see you tomorrow.